Welcome to the Hello Retirement Podcast with Josh Leonard from Leonard Advisory Group. In this podcast, we help those nearing retirement greet it with a well-prepared smile. Join Josh and his guests to learn the retirement and tax planning tips you need so you too can live your golden years with the happiness and excitement you deserve. Hear stories from his years of experience to help you transition into a fun and intentional retirement. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Hello Retirement with your host, Josh Leonard, where we talk about transitioning into retirement with intent. I'm Wendy McConnell. Looks like you have some fun in store for us today, Josh. Yeah, as we're getting prepared for the Halloween holiday, we thought we'd cover some tricks and treats for retirement. Ooh, tricks and treats. I prefer the treats. I'm not a tricker kind of person. I don't know. Okay, okay. (laughs) Fair enough, fair enough. I think my kids appreciate the treats more than anything as well. I I think most people do, right? Yeah, yeah better of the two. So what are some of the things that you've always loved through the years when it comes to Halloween? Yeah, so I think in recent years, it's been watching our kids enjoy Halloween. That's been the biggest thing for us. We live in a cute little historic neighborhood where um, there's a lot of kids that come through the neighborhood and people really seem to get in into the holiday. So I spent most of the weekend hanging up a big purple spider web across the front of our house and putting some spotlights on some witches and things like that. But our kids love dressing up. So Isaac, our youngest son, in fact, has worn his Halloween costume several times already, twice last week to his preschool, including for picture day. So um, that one's definitely getting framed. (laughs) So you're excited about the costume for picture day? Yeah, we don't. It's genuinely who he feels he is at this age. So we'll stick with it. You know, his pronoun last year was Batman. we're going to we're going to let him be Optimus Prime this year and you know what rather than paying for a costume that he only wears once why not wear it out there you go i like it my mother would have never let me do that <laughs> our costumes were a little bit different though we had that plastic cape and that plastic mask that you couldn't mm-hmm. breathe out of. You're a little yeah. bit younger than me, but do you remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. The masks still, I don't think, are all that comfortable. Our kids tend to wear them for a moment and then take them off, so. When it comes to the decorations that you put up, are you typically, I find that people fall into one of two categories. You're either Halloween scary or Halloween cute. I would say more cute. So I don't know. Spider, big giant spider does not ring. Well, it's like a purple, it's like a fun spider web, Wendy. (laughs) We do have a neighbor that had like, like, and several blocks away, but has like the sort of creepy looking dolls. That Mm. is not quite my taste. That is a little bit creepy and out of my comfort zone, but to each their own, right? There you go. There you go. And there's got to be a little both anyway, right? That's right. That's right. We like the diversification in the neighborhood. So exactly. So what is your um, routine for Halloween? Do you do both you and your wife take the kids around? Does one stay back to give out candy? Do you leave a little bowl? Tell me the whole thing. Yeah, one of us will hang back and and help hang out treats. And then we'll kind of switch midway. So one of us will be at home. And then the other one will go out with the kids and then we'll flip about halfway too. So one of the uh, fun things that we like to do is we try to be a fun house. So maybe, you know, have some treats for the adults too. So a hobby that I've picked up in the last year is making some like classic craft cocktails. For this year, I'm going to do the lion's tail, which is like a bourbon based drink. Has a little bit of spice in it as well. Um, some bitters and some sugar syrup in there as well. But that should be a fun one to share with neighbors if they so choose. It'll help make walking around collecting candy even more fun for parents. Okay, and where did you get this recipe from? from Lion's Tail. So it's a classic. It's an old cocktail. There's a few people on YouTube that I follow to like learn some of these cocktails. But I like this one because... It, it has a cool garnish. It's called Twist the Lion's Tail, which is to provoke an enemy, which historically meant angering the British because that was on their um, shield of arms. So the lion, so it was the idea of sort of upsetting the lion. 
So it's when you say it's old, it's really oh, old. it's an old. Yeah, I don't know the exact <laughs> historics of it. I was gonna say it's a, yeah, a, it's an older cocktail. I was a bartender, and I've never once heard of a lion's tail. But you're gonna tell us what's in it, and for people yeah. who want to try it, get ready yeah, to they this absolutely down. Absolutely can. Yeah. So the recipe I'm sticking with is, of course, there's variations. Any old cocktail, there's slight variations, but mine is an ounce and a half of bourbon, three-fourths of an ounce of lime juice, a half ounce of allspice liqueur, a fourth of rich demerara syrup, two dashes of bitters. Go ahead and shake that up in a Boston shaker with ice, and then you can garnish it with a lime, and that's the twist of the lion's tail. So it's like a long strand that you kind of twist up, and you can even lay it across the top of the glass. So, Ooh. Uh, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. Well, it just sounds fancy. It doesn't even have to be good. It's <laughs> like it looks good, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so today we are going to be discussing some tricks and treats for retirement, including some tax tips that won't twist the lion's tail with the lion being the IRS. Right, Josh? I like it. I like it, Wendy. That's it. We never want to upset the IRS. We want to play within the rules. Absolutely. <laughs> There's no way that you want them on the wrong side. That's right. That's right. So I think the one of the biggest things when we think of tricks and treats for retirement, and really this one can kind of stand throughout life, is making sure that you have enough in savings. So having some of that short-term savings. Now, typically, we'll say three to six months of your expenses you should have in savings. We can expand that and say, you know what, you might want a little bit more in your short term savings if you're planning on buying a new car in six months, or maybe that's even two years from now. When we look at the stock market so far this year, it's down about 24%. Uh, I think I'd rather have that money in savings than in the market if it's a short term need. One of the issues that we hear from clients all the time is, well, my bank isn't giving me anything for this money. Can I earn something on this? So our, our little trick here is some ways to earn some yield on your savings. And I think the easiest one is to look for an online high yield savings account. Some of the leading ones now, one that, that I personally use is Citizens Access, and that one's currently paying 2.35%. So that's a, a pretty nice rate as opposed to most of your brick and mortar banks that are paying next to nothing, if not nothing on a savings account. So helps you keep up with inflation. We can also look at brokered CDs. So if you use a brokerage platform like Fidelity, you can buy CDs through there and we can use what's called a CD ladder. That way some of the money is available. So if this is maybe more that intermediate term savings, we could build a two year CD ladder. That way a fourth of the money is coming available every six months. So if you need it, you can go ahead and put that in your regular savings account at that point. A two-year ladder now is yielding about 4.14%. So certainly a little bit higher than that high yield savings and even better than just keeping it in the traditional bank account as well. I would say the other space, if you say, hey, I'm going to buy a car in maybe a year from now, uh, something that's been getting a lot of attention this year are I-bonds or inflation-linked bonds. And those are bought direct through the government, so direct through the treasury. And those are currently yielding 9.62%. I like it. I stands for inflation. So by linking to inflation rates, we get a good rate today. So. So some of those people actually are not as mad about inflation as everyone else is. Well, our limitation is we can only put up to $10,000 per year in it. So we certainly can't throw all of our retirement savings into I bonds and smile knowing that we're doing fine. There is that limitation, but it is a way to benefit from the high inflation rate currently as well. All right. Um, I bonds, we have to be careful because we do have to keep the money there for at least 12 months. So it's more of an intermediate uh, savings tool. We can't access it for 12 months at all. So you want to be careful there. Anything from 12 months up to five years, you pay an interest penalty of the last uh, three months of interest as well. So we want to make sure uh, that we keep that in mind as well. I bonds as well are helpful if you want to give some money to family members or children, adult children, we can certainly use those. Uh, you can gift up to $10,000 per person. That would also be reaching their limit 
of $10,000 as well. But with the end of the year approaching, January 1st, that clock restarts again. So why are there so many rules, Josh? Why? <laughs> why are there so many? I mean, I know the answer, but tell me why. Yeah. Uh, so that I'm employed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes it all worth it. Yeah. No, our retirement planning system and savings and financial system is often very complex, right? We have great financial tools, but sometimes navigating them can be very difficult. You know, with the I bonds, I would say, hey, from the government perspective, we don't want to write an open check that if inflation's high, people can put endless amounts of money there, right? And we also don't want people jumping in and out of them on a daily basis. So let's put some constraints around it. That certainly makes sense. But when we have all these different accounts with all these different rules, it's certainly hard to keep track of. That's why we have financial advisors to help you navigate that. But certainly just like with the tax code, there is so many things to know depending on your expertise and your stage in life. No, no easy answer there, Wendy. Is there an ideal amount of accounts you should have at one time? An ideal number of accounts in terms of your retirement savings and everything, or just in terms of savings accounts? I think in terms of savings accounts, when you're you're gearing up and you're trying to take advantage of this and that and the other thing, like when does it become too much or too many? Yeah, I would say that it, that becomes a very personal decision. So one-on-one -on -one planning with, we're more flexible. We think that you should have a savings account, your regular checking account. Now, depending on the dynamic of your life, you might have several different savings accounts. We have clients that will put aside money for the school taxes or taxes like that, that they know are coming out. So they'll keep that as a separate account, knowing that the money will be there and will be available when they need it. And it keeps it separate from maybe money that they would spend on a vacation. Now, in meeting with one client last week, we discussed one of his travel goals for this next year uh, was going to London. So we said, hey, let's just go ahead and start directing the amount of money that you're going to need for that trip into a separate savings account. It won't be at risk, but as you see that balance grow, it'll encourage you to actually book the flight and not be worried about the money. So we can use savings goals to help us, or savings accounts to help us achieve our goals there as well. So one of the other tips that I wanted to share today is being able to give more by giving tax efficiently. So there's a few different ways um, that, that we can do that. We'll cover three different ways today. The first would be using a qualified charitable distribution or a QCD. So if you're subject to RMDs, which are required minimum distribution, when the IRS says, hey, you need to take a certain amount out of your IRA, 401k, 403b, because now you're old enough that we want to tax you on that money. For most folks that are just getting to that age, it's age 72. It used to be 70 and a half. With a qualified charitable distribution, you can take all of that required distribution or a portion of it and send it directly to a charity, which makes it a non-taxable event. So you won't have to pay tax on that money. If you instead take that distribution, deposit it into your bank account, and then write a check to charity, that would be an itemized deduction from your tax return. So unless you're above the standard deduction, you wouldn't be able to take that as a deduction. So this is a good way to, to get more to the charity and less directly to Uncle Sam. Now, when they updated the RMD rules and pushed the starting age out to age 72, they didn't change the QCD starting age. So if you're 70 and a half and you know that you have a pretty big IRA, 401k balance, and you're probably not going to need to spend all that money, uh, once you do reach age 72, you can start those qualified charitable distributions in the year or after you turn age 70 and a half. So Josh, what else can we do? Yeah. So qualified charitable distributions are one way. Maybe you're not 70 and a half yet, but you're still looking to get more to charity, or maybe you have a very large tax year. So that could be receiving a buyout for a company. If you're forced into retirement and they decide, Hey, we're going to pay you six months of income more. Well, all of a sudden you're bumping up into a higher tax bracket. So one of the ways we can combat that is we can set up a donor advised fund and a donor advised fund kind of works like a retirement account for charities. So you can donate whatever amount of money into that account 
uh, during this year and take the full tax deduction for it. But you don't have to give the money to the individual charities that year. You can grant it to charities, whether that's your church or um, animal friends or whatever it might be that's important to you. You can grant that money out over any period of time. And one of the cool advantages of that as well is if you put a large sum of money into a donor advised fund, you can invest it so you can continue to grow that sum of money and distribute smaller portions of it over time. Okay, let's talk about um, stocks and what can you do when it comes to your stocks? Sure. Yeah, so there's two ways we can gift stocks to benefit us in a tax perspective. And in, in gifting with charity, you can gift that stock directly to a charity. If you were to sell a highly appreciated stock, so let's say you bought a stock for $10 and now it's worth $100. If you sold that, you'd pay capital gains tax on $90 or on your gain in that stock. If we gift it away to charity, well, we get to take the deduction for the fair value of that stock, and we don't have to pay a gain for it. If instead we were to say, I'm going to sell the stock, pay the taxes on the $90, and then give it to charity, we're able to give less to charity there. And again, we're giving more to Uncle Sam. If you're giving money to family members as well, so many of our clients have younger kids that are maybe just getting started and aren't earning all that much money yet. So you can also look at gifting that stock to a child or a family member. And when they sell that stock, they'll pay capital gains at their income rate. If they're maybe in college or not earning much money at all, they might not pay any capital gains on that, depending on how much money it is. How common is a practice like that? It's fairly common. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, many people are unaware of it. So this is something we try to educate clients on. Hey, if you are helping out your children that are young adults, great, let's do it in a more tax efficient way, right? And so that's, a, that's one easy way to do it. You can, uh, like I said before, you can, you can donate those stocks directly to a charity as well. And it works the same way. So just setting up that infrastructure is more the time consuming part. So making sure that you gain all the correct information to give it to a charity, because we don't want to give it to a, a undeserving third party, of course. Are you worried about a recession? There's no telling how long a recession will last or what the worst of it will look like. Rather than staying up at night, let's lead with logic instead of fear. That's the focus of this month's Visual Insights newsletter, How to Weather a Recession. To check it out and sign up for our monthly newsletter, click on the link in the show notes. Okay, tell me a little bit about taking advantage of the current market conditions. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, the S&P 500, or what most of us uh, view as the gauge of the U.S. stock market, is down about 24% so far here in 2022. That hurts, right? If we had $100 there and we lost 24% of it, oof, well, we're down to $76. So that is painful. If we think of it like a slinky, that classic toy that we all rolled down the steps, and it always worked a little bit better on the commercial, but that's besides the point. It if we did. Think of, yeah. <laughs> we think of the stock market like a slinky. Maybe last year that slinky was more stretched out. It was stretched out a little bit further. And now those earnings or the profits of a company are compressed tighter. So it's almost like when the slinky stacked. If we look at strategies like a Roth conversion now, while those values are compressed, we can get more out of it. So if we think of a Roth conversion. If we had $100 in a stock, now it's worth $76. If we do a Roth conversion that causes us to pay tax on that share today. Well, today we would pay tax on $76 rather than $100. And I don't know about you, Wendy, but I'd rather pay tax on less money than more money. Right? Sounds good to me, Josh. I like it. <laughs> and if the stock market's hitting a new high, let's say in a year from now or whatever point in the future, we would never pay taxes on that money again. So if it goes back, if that slinky stretches back out and we're at a hundred dollar valuation again, we have a hundred dollars worth of tax-free money at that point. So now's a great time to look at Roth conversions. For many of our clients too, they might have a large concentration in company stock. 
So if they worked for a company for a really long time, maybe they bought some in their 401k or they were given it over time, it was part of their compensation, and they ended up having a really high concentration in that company stock. We view anything above 10% in one stock as an outsized risk. If we think of companies, of course, like Enron or even GE, we watch stock prices completely collapse or take substantial drops very quickly. We don't want to see that for clients nearing and in retirement. We want to make sure that they're properly diversified. So if you have more than 10% in company stock, often the pain is, well, if I sell it, I'm going to have to pay a lot of taxes. So while stock prices are down, this is a good time to diversify further. So maybe sell some of that company stock to lower your concentration. We can buy other similar stocks in the stock market to still have the same type exposure and help us regain the value as asset prices go back up. Another strategy that we can use now is tax loss harvesting. So it's fall, so we can it's a little bit different than harvesting crops, but we can think of it in a similar way. Tax loss harvesting would be going through the portfolio and trying to match some of those gains with losses by selling stocks or any position that is down for now, we'll be able to get a tax credit for that. Now, there's certain rules around that too. We can't sell a stock today and buy it back tomorrow and call it a loss. The IRS will say, no, that's a wash sale rule. We are unable to do that. But what we can do is we could say, hey, you know what? I've had a lot in this individual stock for a while. I'm going to buy something a little bit different now. This is a great time to realize that loss to help offset some gains. You know, what's cool is, you know, there are some benefits to this downturn that we're going through right now. You just need you to tell us how to navigate it properly, right? Well, Wendy, I'll take that. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, I think one of the great benefits that I've seen in about my 10 years in the industry is advisors are starting to bring more and more strategies to their clients as well. So of course, I'd hope that if you don't already, you work with us, but meeting with your financial professional to talk about some of these strategies in a down market is a great way to make lemon out of lemon or make lemonade out of lemons, right? Or so, a lion's tail out of- Or a, yeah, take that <laughs> lime and, and twist the lion's tail. That's right, that's right. You know, that's it. We really want our clients and all of you listening to not necessarily try to beat the market in these challenging times, but rather develop an efficient plan that helps you take advantage of the current market conditions to help you reach your long-term goals. Unfortunately, we always hear awful stories about people that had too high of a concentration in this type of asset or this type of asset. When we have pullbacks like this, we want you to be prepared for these recessions before they occur and not trying to fix everything after they occur. You know, by making those smart health tax decisions and allocation decisions, you can still keep on track for your goals even when we are in a recession. Wow. I really feel like I have been schooled today. <laughs> well, Wendy, I'll, I'll review your notes after this podcast <laughs> recording and we can discuss, make sure you got everything. Pop quiz time. Are there any uh, final notes, any final words of wisdom before we go off to trick or treat? Yes. Be patient. Enjoy that time with your family and friends. Whatever's going on on the news isn't everything. I know I'll have a great time walking around our neighborhood, seeing neighbors and friends through the holiday season. So I hope everyone else is able to do the same. And how can people get in touch with you, Josh? Sure. So uh, feel free to check out our website at leonardadvisorygroup.com. You can email me at jleonard at leonardadvisorygroup.com or give our office a call at 412-998-PLAN. Medicare open enrollment is underway and will stay open until December 7th. Medicare is a complex system that can easily be misunderstood. If you are nearing Medicare age or already on Medicare, your mailbox is probably full of advertisements and processing all this information can be overwhelming. The Leonard Advisory Group is here to help. Please join me on Thursday, November 10th at 11 a.m. Eastern to learn more about Medicare to help you make the decision that's best for you. Click the link in the show notes to sign up. Thank you, Josh. And thank you for joining us on Hello Retirement. 
Please like, follow, and share this podcast. Until next time, I'm Wendy McConnell. Thank you for listening to the Hello Retirement Podcast, the show that helps you transition into a happy, fun, and intentional retirement. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.leonardadvisorygroup.com or give us a call at 412-998-PLAN. And don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Leonard Advisory Group, LLC. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service professionals with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.